Okay. Um, hello, Peter. Hello, Walid. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really glad to have you here um, and to have the opportunity to talk to Peter Croppens about his work. Um, Peter is Assistant Professor of Islamic Studies um, at the Faculty of Religion and Theology at the Freie Universität Amsterdam. Um, and he has done research on Quranic exegesis actually for a long time. Um, his PhD thesis was about um, eschatology and the vision of God in Sufi Quranic commentaries from the early middle period, so quite a bit earlier than what he is presenting now. Um, and his current project deals with Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi um, and his Quranic commentary. Um, and the influence of the rise of the printing press on the genre of Tafsir, which is something he's going to kind of problematize in this talk. Um, so his book on Sufi Quran commentaries has been published by Edinburgh University Press, and I really recommend it. It's a great book on Sufi Tafsir. It's really a must read if you're interested in this. Um, and he has some forthcoming papers um, on his current topic, for example, in the Journal of Quranic Studies um, on the relationship between modernity and polyvalence, ambiguity in Tafsir, which is a big discussion in general in Islamic studies right now, of course. Um, so, and um, his next monograph, which he has yet to write, but which he has done a lot of research for already, is about Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi. Um, and actually, I just I checked my mailbox this morning and I found that he first contacted me about this topic in 2014. So he asked about possibilities of doing a postdoc on this topic. And I was really excited at the time because um, I felt that this was, I mean, this is so typical for Tafsir in general. You know, you have this important person and you have biographies on him and everything, but they don't even mention his Tafsir, or maybe they mention it in passing, but it hasn't been studied. And at first glance, people think, okay, it's boring. We don't need to look at it. It's just, you know, he just quotes a lot of opinions of earlier exegetes, so let's not look into it. But obviously, Peter found it just as interesting as I did at the time. So, and I'm really glad he took this up and, and did this study. Um, and maybe, Peter, you could start by just telling us a little about Al-Qasimi and um, how he's relevant and how his tafsir is relevant. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Johanna. I think it was even 2013, uh, perhaps, that I mailed you for the first time about this. And actually, in some ways, uh, I mean, I've been interested in Qasimi much longer than that even, but uh, I think in some ways it uh, was born out of my PhD project. Oh, that happens just right now. Okay. I think it was born um, uh, out of my PhD in some ways, because uh, as you said, my PhD was about uh, Sufi tafsir. And I was always wondering why so many of these Sufi tafsir didn't really make it into modernity. Well, I mean, there's obviously such a big legacy of Sufi tafsir uh, up until the 19th century. And then in the, uh, in the 20th century, they somehow Just disappeared. Don't worry the, about it. This will be a, a hit on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, actually, they are always... Uh, yeah, on my uh, on my desk when I'm doing research, so I mean they they accompany me even now, um, <clears throat> and I think uh, the story that I'm telling you today has a lot to do with why they didn't make it into uh, the present, because uh, I believe uh, that during the 19th century a lot of fundamental changes happened in the way we look at uh, tafsir, and Walid has of course done. Yeah, wonderful research on that. So uh, I'm very happy that he's to discuss them today. This is getting a bit annoying now. Uh, <clears throat> so Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi, uh, let me see, I have a picture of him. I must see how I can share the screen. We just practiced this, so I think it should work now. Uh, Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi is born in 1866. You can see my screen now? Yeah. Okay, he's born in 1866 to a scholarly family in Damascus uh, from a Shafi uh, background. And he has a very typical education uh, for that age in some uh, basic mutun, mostly in Shafi fiqh. He becomes a hafiz of the Quran. He studies khat uh, for a long time. Um, uh, he does uh, tajweed, as is expected, some basic texts in Aqeedah and some glosses on it, some commentaries and some super commentaries. He studies with the grand scholars of that age. 
Um, uh, he is a Naqshbani for some time in his youth uh, as well. And uh, then at some point he gets into touch with a different circle of people uh, who somehow emerge. That's the theory at least from uh, the circle around Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi. There's a big influx of people from uh, Algeria in that time in Damascus and they have their own study circles. Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi has a huge private library. And then the main scholar of that age is Abdul Razak al-Baytar, uh, who is under the influence of Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi. And they start their own study circle. Uh, Jamal al-Din al-Qasim is quite young uh, at that time yet. And they start discussing other texts than is the mainstream at that time. So they break away from this regime of uh, basic mutun and glasses that they are supposed to stick to. And they start discussing other texts. And there's a yeah, very famous story that is quoted a lot in scholarship on the 19th century in Damascus, that they come together and read a text by Abdul Wahab al-Sha'arani, for example, Kashf uh, al-Umma and Jamil al-Umma, which is a basic text uh, yeah, of hadith um, uh, that they start discussing with each other. And uh, this leads to a big uh, controversy in Damascus that has become known as the yeah, Hadith al Mujtahideen, the so-called Mujtahids uh, incident, uh, which is documented actually, uh, because he wrote about this in his diary. And uh, when you read this narrative, you can see that the complaint against them was twofold. Um, they, were, um, they were accused of plotting against the Ottoman uh, authorities in Damascus, and they were accused of engaging in ijtihad. Uh, and this accu accusation was because they were not sticking to the basic mutun in fiqh, but that they were uh, engaged in exegesis themselves. So uh, the, um, uh, what's the English word? The, um, the one accusing them, uh, he's asking them, for example, ma lakum bi kutub tafsir so why are you engaged with these books of tafsir? And why are you engaged with hadith? And why are you reading this by yourselves? Why don't you stick to the kutub uh, al-fiqh al-khatir? So the basic texts in fiqh that you need to discuss. Um, <clears throat> so you can really see uh, a paradigm shift going on there. And in the end, they, they spend one night in jail, or at least Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi spends one night in jail. But there you can see there is a change in the culture uh, of that time. It's really a, a paradigm shift, uh, you could say. And I think it's no coincidence that uh, this accusation of ijtihad was paired with the accusation of uh, plotting against the Ottoman Empire, because the Ottoman Empire, uh, it was in a way dependent uh, on this regime of basic fiqh uh, mutun. It was also a way of having influence on the scholarly debates that were conducted uh, in that time in Damascus. And to break away from that regime, it was in a way considered uh, a kind of rebellion against the Ottoman authorities, you could say. So uh, what I'm looking at in my, um, in my research uh, is I, I really, I'm really very much influenced by Walid uh, in this. I mean, Walid calls this the Salafi hermeneutical paradigm, and he has claimed in a couple of articles that this became very dominant uh, in the 20th century only. Uh, I agree with Walid. Uh, this is a bit boring, perhaps, for the discussion later on, but uh, I think uh, Walid is really right in this observation uh, that there is really a new canon. Uh, determined uh, by scholars in the 20th century that is very different from what happened until the 19th century. Uh, and I'm trying to understand the position of uh, Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi in this paradigm shift in uh, the canon of uh, tafsir. I try to understand how the printing press has been of influence uh, on this. Uh, so I'm looking at the sources that uh, were available to Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi. For that, I'm delving into the library catalogs of that time. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to get the catalog of his private library, which was in the, the possession of the family, um, even in the time that uh, David Cummins was doing his research. I've been uh, in in touch with the family, but they have sold the library and they cannot find this catalog anymore. So now very much like 
Conrad Hirschler, I have to do like a, a provenance research. So I have to reconstruct somehow what was available to Al Qasimi through his uh, writings uh, in manuscript form and in print form. Uh, and for the Zahiriya library, I can by now uh, reconstruct that mostly, uh, but also the Ottoman public library of Damascus, for example, and also the Khalidiya library in Jerusalem that was available to Al Qasimi. Uh, I can see quite well now what was available there uh, in the field of Tafsir and also in other fields. But obviously, I mean, the rise of the printing press, it led to a greater av availability of sources to Al-Qasimi than only 50 years earlier, uh, a scholar in Damascus would have to his, uh, mostly his availability, sometimes her. Um, the reorganization uh, of the Maktab al Zahiriya was obviously of a very big influence on Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi, and I try to understand that as well. Uh, later in his life, Tahir al-Jazairi, uh, it became one of his most intimate friends. They would spend uh, days and nights together and discuss manuscripts, discuss books, uh, discuss tafsir uh, as well. And I tried to see how that influenced uh, the way he wrote his tafsir. But actually, I mean, I tried to understand two things. I tried to understand how it influenced his tafsir, uh, but I also try to understand through his tafsir how this reorganization of the Maktab al Zahiriya looked like and how this influence of Tahir al-Jazairi uh, looked like. So it works in two ways. It's like a hermeneutical circle. What, what do you think was, I mean, why, why did he write a work of Tafsir? I mean, he could have written a lot of things and I think he wrote this fairly late in his not yeah. so long life. I mean, he died relatively young, I think. Um, so what was the attraction of this particular genre? Yeah. I, that's a difficult question, I think, actually, and I, I think it's it's a difficult question throughout the entire history of Tafsir, uh, why they wrote this. Um, I mean, I think for a long time, writing a Tafsir was almost like doing a PhD or doing your habilitation, I think. It was a way to, to show to your peers, in a way, that you can... Um, that you can master the, the most exalted science. I mean, tafsir is mostly seen as the most exalted science. And so I think throughout history, you could say it's just something you did as a scholar uh, to show your mastery of uh, all fields of scholarship, uh, but also to show somehow your love affair with the Quran, perhaps, or to show that you have a certain kind of obedience to God's word. Uh, but I think for Qasimi, I think this could all have been motives, but that it was also more than that, and that it was also a way to uh, show his different agenda in the Islamic sciences, to really uh, show what should be changed in the way uh, they deal with Islamic scholarship and the past of Islamic scholarship. Uh, it was obviously something that he taught as well. So I think it was also a product of his teaching. And I have seen in journal articles how his students uh, speak, for example, about the way he was teaching tafsir and how radically different it was from everything they were used to up to then. So I think it was also a way to support uh, the things he was teaching. Um, but I think one of the most important things for him was to, to make relatively unknown sources known to a broader audience. So for example, in his private, um, uh, in, in his private letters to Muhammad Nasif, for example, at some point uh, when he has really finished writing the tafsir, uh, he writes to uh, Muhammad Nasif that he uh, finished writing, his and writing it and that he's now uh, uh, going through the entire text again and that it was really his intention I will get back to this later, actually. It was really intention to include everything of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Al-Qayyim that they ever wrote about the Quran. Uh, and that he, uh, that he really wants to do this because he noticed that uh, the later tradition largely ignored Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Al-Qayyim. And to him, they are such important scholars. And I think he really wanted to bring them back into the limelight through this uh, tafsir and really offer a different... Uh, a view on the tafsir tradition than was the mainstream until then. Um, 
It's funny, actually, I mean, uh, I think I, e I emailed this to you uh, before the lecture as well. Uh, when you look at the, at the print history of the Tafsir of al Qasimi, uh, it was only printed for the first time in the 1950s. And you can see from correspondence when he, was, he just passed away, it was their intention to publish it much earlier, but it just didn't happen somehow. So it is, it is clear that Qasimi was really, he did intend to really publish it. Uh, probably during his lifetime already, but uh, during, due, yeah, due to circumstances, it was only published for the fir first time in the 1950s. Uh, but I think it was still really influential through his teaching and through his students, uh, who all adopted his view in some kind of way or the other. Would you, uh, could you say something about Ibn Taymiyyah? I mean, um, how, how did he discover Ibn Taymiyyah and in what way was Ibn Taymiyyah important for him and especially for yeah. his well, actually, uh, a student from Utrecht University could say much more about that uh, than me, Hayat Ahlili. It's really some fun, someone you should think of inviting, perhaps even. Uh, but what you can see is that at that time, uh, there was a movement of rediscovering uh, the writings uh, of Ibn Taymiyyah. It was a movement uh, in Yemen, in India, in Damascus, in Baghdad, in Cairo. Uh, they were all corresponding with each other, but I think Damascus in many ways was an epicenter for this movement because many manuscripts of Ibn Taymiyyah uh, uh, and also Ibn al qayyim were stocked in private libraries uh, in Damascus. So um, Qasimi and Jazairi, they could reach manuscripts that other people could not yet, uh, could not yet reach. And I think one of the most Important examples is uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's uh, treatise Qawaid fi Tafsir, which later became uh, famous as Al Muqaddimah fi Usul al Tafsir. It was partly a discovery of uh, Jamal al Din al Qasimi, I believe, together with the Shatti uh, family, uh, an important Hanbali family uh, in Salahiyya, Damascus. Uh, some of the manuscripts of Ibn Taymiyyah were in uh, their private library. And Tahir al Jazairi and Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi worked on that together with uh, the Shatli family. I think the first publication was also done by uh, Jamal al Shatli, I think. I'm looking at Walid. He has looked more deep into that already than I have. Uh, and one of the students of Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi, Muhib al-Din al-Khatib, he eventually publishes it as, uh, as well in Cairo with the um, uh, Maktab al-Salafiyya. Uh, or the Matba Salafiyya uh, printing press uh, in Cairo. Um, so Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi, he, uh, he incorporates that treatise completely in his introduction. And he starts teaching it to his students. And uh, I think that's how the legacy of Ibn Taymiyyah somehow starts. And then you see more and more people start reading that treatise. Uh, this week I was going through Munir uh, Abdu Aga, uh, for example, uh, a scholar from uh, Damascus who was living in Cairo, uh, who was really a, yeah, what you could call a Wahhabi Salafi. Who, he was also very much influenced by uh, Muhammad ibn uh, Abdul Wahhab. And I was looking at his uh, yeah, perception of the history of Tafsir, and he also incorporates uh, this treatise completely. So somehow always there is a link uh, to Damascus uh, <laughs> when people are interested in Ibn Taymiyyah, I believe. Yeah, um, that's that's yeah. really interesting. Um, yeah, I once worked on Al Qasimi or on 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 an issue. I mean, like uh, Quran ninety five, the first verse by the fig and yeah. the olive, and um, then I was really intrigued by Al Qasimi's commentary because he incorporated the interpretation of Ibn Taymiyyah, which was yeah. very unusual. Uh, he yes. in, he included something of Tabari, which was also. Um, I mean, of Tabari's history, mm -hmm. not his tafsir, which was also yeah. very unusual. But yes. then he also included a very recent journal article from Al Manar, and I even yeah, think he must typical. have inserted it into his tafsir later because it was published after the tafsir is su yeah. was supposedly completed. Um, so he he really has this mix of sources, yeah. but he doesn't really comment on any of them he's just okay yeah. we've got this source we've got this source we've got this source well wallahu alam you know yeah. so which is not unusual for work of tafsir actually um but i think it led some of his students or later intellectuals to criticize him yeah um which might also be connected to to the whole issue of um accepting 
ambiguity or accepting polyvalent meanings, etc. Yeah. Well, could you say something more about this? What made his tafsir unusual? In what way was it a conventional work of tafsir? In what way was it? I mean, I, I don't like the term original, yeah. but, but but what was really his his individual take on? Yeah. Well, I think if uh, if if we look at it uh, with our uh, yeah with our twentieth or twenty first century eyes, uh, we yeah we would indeed consider it a very unoriginal work of tafsir, because indeed all he does is copying uh, the preceding tradition. He's very eclectic indeed, so uh, you should not be surprised finding Ibn Arabi, for example, also in his tafsir beside Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, so he really just copied everything uh, he liked. Also sometimes uh, Shia uh, sources, but for everything that he felt, well, uh, this author has a point, uh, he would just uh, include it. Uh, but for his time, uh, it was very, very yeah, original, I would say. Uh, I mean, you mentioned uh, his later colleagues, and uh, for example, Muhammad Kurt Ali, uh, one of his most prominent uh, students, who I would count as part of the Arabic intelligentsia who were on the rise then. Uh, he was very annoyed with Qasimi at a certain point, and he accused him of being not scholarly at all in the way he was writing, that he was just copying everything and sometimes not even mentioning the sources, which is very typical in many ways for uh, the tradition back then. But then in his selection of sources, I would say he was very original in his own time because he was really incorporating sources that no one had really heard of until then. To mention an example from his introduction, I think more than half of his introduction, Tamhid Khatir, Fiqh Qawaid al-Tafsir, so the introduction where he explains all the, um, yeah, the fundamentals of the craft of Tafsir, more than half of it consists of uh, copies from Shatabi's Muwafaqat. And now we would think, yeah, well, Shatibi's Muafaqat, I mean, it's, it's a basic text, right? I mean, everybody has heard of it. But uh, by that time, I think in 1896, I say from the top of my head, it was printed for the first time in Tunis. And it wasn't really known yet in, uh, in the East. And um, I think he got to know this text only in Beirut when he was uh, traveling to Beirut and probably he copied a copy there or perhaps in Cairo when he was in Cairo. And from the fact that he copied so much from it, uh, I, I mean, it's speculative, but I think that means that it was not a really well-known text in his circles and that copying it by hand was a way to make it more known in his own uh, scholarly circles. And you see that with Ibn Hazm, for example, as well. I mean, Ibn Hazm was just being rediscovered in his time. And he also was part of that rediscovery. When he was in Medina, for example, he copied a lot from al muhalla uh, which was not yet printed uh, in that time. And he, cop he incorporates a lot from Al-Muhalla, for example, and also from Al-Milal, from Ibn Hazm in his work. Uh, that was highly unusual when he was writing this tafsir. And I think by incorporating that, he was trying to make these works known to a wider audience than they were uh, known to by then. And a lot of these works, again, were later edited and printed by students of his. So Muhib al al Khatib, uh, also Ahmed Muhammad Shakir, who was in touch with Qasimi. He was not really a student of Qasimi, but in touch with Qasimi. Uh, they are the people who later then pick up uh, publishing uh, all these sources. So again, I think he was like, a, like an epicenter for the rediscovery of all these authors. And, okay, I mean, so... If I can, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, if I can show you some, um, uh, sorry, uh, some slides. I mean, I've been going through all these, uh, so new international contexts are also very important, I think. Uh, so basically what I'm doing, I'm looking at the commentary tradition uh, of Damascus in the 19th century now. Uh, and I'm going through all these biographies to see what they were doing with tafsir. And then you can really see how per pervasive uh, Zamakhshari was, Baidawi was, Jalalain was, uh, Irshad al-Aqal al-Salim from um, uh, Abu Saud uh, Effendi. I mean, these were really the, the, the texts that they were uh, studying uh, in their study circles. 
Some authors, and these, this is also what is uh, dominant in the library catalogs in the 19th century. I mean, there are exceptions, but the main uh, works in libraries at that time is all the Ottoman curriculum, so to speak. Uh, when you look at uh, scholars in Damascus who were authoring tafsir themselves, it is very few, but mostly it was glosses. So uh, let me see uh, some examples. Uh, I think your video froze. Are you still there? Peter, we don't hear yeah. you. Oh, yeah. Now you hear oh. me again? Now I hear you. Yeah. Okay, I think there's the problem with my internet connection. Um, so you see, mostly they are Hawashi uh, on Baidawi, on Nasafi, on Jalalain. Um, some people they mentioned that they were studying uh, at Tafsir al Kabir by Arazi. Uh, but they had to travel to Cairo to do that, for example. Uh, Badr al-Din al-Hassani, who is an important uh, figure in the later Salafi movement. He was teaching Tafsir al-Jalalain, for example, and he also wrote a hashia on Tafsir al-Jalalain. Uh, some people would write uh, Sufi Tafsir, so for example, uh, Sheikh Taqtaq. Uh, he wrote uh, Tafsir on Surat al-Saf, completely according to uh, the Ishari method. Um, yeah, and that's about it. And I think the tafsir of uh, Asherbini was also taught uh, by Bakir al-Attar, for example. But you, you can really see that Baidawi, Zamakhshari, uh, Jalalain, Abu Saud, this is dominant. Um, in both the libraries and in the teaching circles and when they are uh, writing. So Qasimi was really breaking very radically uh, with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, could you um, could you say a bit more about the role of print? I mean, Al Qasimi yeah. Tafsir. You've already told us that it wasn't printed until much later, which was partly yeah. due to his, uh, to his early death and First World War, etc. All the disruptions. Yeah. Um, the colonization so of Damascus as well. Yeah. We have a manuscript work that includes manuscript sources, printed sources. So, what role did print play? Because you, well, you yeah. are the title of your talk so obviously must be a, a big consideration yeah well it mostly uh, played a role in the uh, sources that he uh, could get to uh, i think so he incorporates uh, a lot of sources that are just printed uh, for the first time uh, when he starts uh, starts writing it so that's uh, i mean i'm still busy with uh, tracing uh, all these things uh, back but to give one example, uh, the Tafsir of Barawi, it was only very recently printed for the first time in India, in the time that Qasimi was living. And he went through a lot of trouble to get a print of that. Uh, it was available in uh, Damascus, actually, in manuscript form. Uh, but uh, he also wanted to have it in print. And he wrote to Mohammed Nasif about this as well. And uh, there was a very, uh, the, the trade routes between India and Damascus were very weak at that time. And he was complaining about that to Mohammed Nasif. Uh, I cannot get this uh, print from India and I really need it. Can you help uh, me with it? And in the end, he did get it. And he said, I really wanted this uh, because this work is specifically praised by Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Al-Qayyim as the best work of tafsir. And he said, I really want to model my tafsir uh, according to the vision of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Al-Qayyim. I want to follow their mashrab. And that's why I really wanted to use the tafsir of Barawi. So that's a good example. And uh, I think it, it would have been available to him in the, um, in the libraries of uh, Damascus, of course, but it would be easier for him to work with a print version and then it would be available to him all the time. And I think it made it easier for him to, to go back to these sources all the time and uh, use it for revision. And of course, I mean, that's why it's too bad that I don't have his, uh, the catalog of his private library. Uh, you should imagine he was probably writing this stuff here in his private library. And when you have, uh, I mean, we know this from how we are now working with Maktab Shamala, for example, when you have all these works available to you all the time, it becomes much easier to write your book, right? I mean, it's not like we go to Beirut one time and we look into some manuscripts and then we have to memorize them or, uh, 
uh, something. So the fact that he could do more than just writing a glass like most of his comp contemporaries did, I think it has to do with that he had a private library that not only contained manuscripts that are hard to navigate, but also uh, contained printed texts uh, that were much easier to navigate, that often had indexes, etc., so that he could easier look up specific matters or specific questions. And I think that's really the big uh, paradigm shift at that time. So, for example, Badr al-Din al-Hassani, uh, with, with whom he had a lot, of, lot in common, or, um, yeah, they, were, they still felt obliged, in a way, to write a gloss and to engage with the glossary tradition. And that's something that he could really break with. So by now, if, if I can show it in a, I mean, I think this is common knowledge by now actually, but uh, let me see, for example, this is how I would um, make a typology of this uh, glossary tradition. And I owe a lot to Walid uh, in reconstructing this. Uh, so there's the Kashaf by Zamakhshari, and then the, there is Anwar Tanzil and Irshad al-Aqil al-Salim with some Hawashi. And then if you were really, really, really good as a scholar, you would also read uh, Razi, Kashani, Kurtubi, Suyuti. But most people, they would not go further than uh, Kashaf and Anwar al-Tanzil, or perhaps maybe even only Anwar al-Tanzil or something. And uh, this is really something that Ibn Taymiyyah could, or um, Qasimi could do away with. I mean, it's, if you look at this pre-modern uh, tradition, it's mostly Kalam and Lugha, Athar and Ahkam, and philosophy and theosophy. And you can see for Qasimi, uh, basically Athar, Ahkam, and Lugha, this is what remains. So he does away with Kalam. That's also why he's still so popular in Salafi circles until this day. And also philosophy and theosophy, he doesn't engage with that anymore. And I think that really has to do with the rise uh, of the printing press, uh, the rediscovery of uh, Kutub al-Salaf, as they used to call it, so the works of the earliest generations. So he can really skip this whole glossary tradition and go back to the classical uh, tradition. Is that clear a bit? Yeah. Um, Sorry for the poor no, uh, graph. This, but <laughs> this paradigm shift, I mean, it's yeah. possible to, to have different perspectives on it. Um, yeah. you know, this shift to a Salafi paradigm, you can see it as an immense impoverishment of a mm -hmm. very rich tradition. Yeah. Um, which was, I mean, big parts of it were just completely rejected and thrown out the window. Mm -hmm. um, but this is partly also, I think, from the lens of a specific later brand of Salaf, yes. which was very yes. rigid, very narrow, and probably much narrower than people like Shaukani or Al Qasimi really were. Yeah. If you at their tough years. Yeah, absolutely. This is one way yeah. to see it. And on the other hand, if you look at Ahmed Al Shamsi's recent book, for example, mm -hmm. we are also going to have a talk with him later. I think this, this is going to come <laughs> up again and again. But yeah. much more sympathetic to the concerns of reformers like Al Qasimi and to their frustration with the intellectual milieu, which they considered yes. actually not like rich and uh, ambiguous and whatever, yeah. all these, you know. This maybe sometimes yeah. like a romanticized view that we have today of this period, but they yeah. considered this heritage restraining and they actually considered Ibn Taymiyyah's ideas liberating, I think. Yes. But could you yeah, say absolutely. more about this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree with uh, Ahmed Chamsi and everything he says about this. And uh, I think indeed uh, to Qasimi and the circle around him, it was all about opening up really. And uh, I think uh, that Ahmed Shamsi rightly pointed this out, that for them, uh, this, this post-classical period, they really saw it as uh, very limiting. And uh, they really felt that all these glasses, uh, they, uh, it was not just offering enough to them uh, intellectually, and they felt it was not suitable to, uh, uh, to address the new issues of their time. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, if you compare it to the Tafsir al-Manar, for example, uh, I would say that uh, the Tafsir of al-Qasimi um, is closer to purist Salafism as we understand it today, actually. And it's also much more appreciated in these circles. Uh, but still, I would argue, uh, although he's not a modernist as Abdu was, uh, still it was about opening up for him and discussing things that they were not used to discussing uh, in that time. 
And I think that's also one of the reasons why he's focusing on uh, Usul uh, so much. I think that's also something that Shamsi uh, pointed out. Uh, let me see. So, I mean, the second step in my research is to look at the Tamhid Khatir Fi Qawad Tafsir. I think the reason why he had such a big introduction on uh, the usul um, uh, of the science of tafsir, it has to do with this idea of we have to open things up. And how do you open things up? To, by teaching people the usul of a science so that they can engage with it themselves. So, um, Qasimi, he was publishing a lot on Usul and he was uh, digging up all these forgotten treatises uh, on Usul and he was getting them printed for a wider audience. And I think he was doing the same in his tafsir. And if you look at this, for example, I found this uh, only two days ago in uh, Majallat al-Muqtabas. I think this is written by Muhammad Kul Ali. This was uh, um, a review of the first print of Kitab al-Um by Shafi. And here you also see this, uh, he says, the minds of the men of this ummah of this age have come to realize that from among the grandest causes of re revival, I'm sorry, there's a problem with my transcription, I see, I still have to fix that, is the work on the books written in the first centuries of Islam. So there's this idea, if you go back to the books written in the first centuries of Islam, this will liberate us from this post-classical uh, narrowness, uh, of all these glasses that are so boring and stifled, to purely be of service to society and to be to its use sincerely without hidden motives of goal or goals. So there's also an accusation here towards this glossary culture. So this glossary culture, it's only abused uh, by scholars for, um, yeah, for politics. I mean, for us as academics, we understand that very well, I think. I mean, we were also trying to make our careers and often we try to make careers by finding faults in others and, I mean, you can see that this glossary system, this is a criticism that this glossary system was used for that. And I think the Mujtahid incident is also a case uh, of that. Okay. Would the, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, we're slowly running out of time, especially. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Because there was still one issue I wanted to address before Walid uh, gets the floor, yeah. whatever you'd call it on Zoom. Um, the computer, the, the internet, whatever. Um, so... The last issue I wanted to, to address is that you're, um, I mean, you've mentioned a lot of people who uh, Jamal al Al-Qasimi interacted yeah. with, friends, uh, other scholars, people who helped him find books, and you've been working on applying some digital humanities yes. to uh, recreating his networks. And if you could yes. just very briefly give us an example. <laughs> in minutes yeah, or sure. I'm sorry that I've been talking maybe not uh, efficiently enough because there was so much more I wanted to share. But this is a talk, and we'll just yeah. see the topics we managed to cover. And okay. Yeah, I can show you. I'm uh, I'm working on on a database in uh, Gaffi now, so I'm uh, working with uh, these sources now, uh, the Tarikh Ulama Dimasht, that some of you may know. Uh, these are scholarly biographies uh, of all scholars from Damascus in the 14th century. And <clears throat> I'm uh, changing that into an Excel sheet. So all the uh, scholars of that time, uh, their biographies, I'm looking to relations, looking at relations that are described in it, and I'm uh, putting them into an Excel sheet. Uh, and this Excel sheet, I can make it into, uh, oh, you cannot see it now, right? Uh, sorry. Uh, I, I can, yeah. Oh, you can? Yeah, okay. Uh, so this I can, uh, this spreadsheet, I can upload it into Gaffy. Uh, wait, sorry. I should have practiced with Zoom a bit more. Uh, let me show you Gaffy now. Um, so in Gaffy, I can run uh, all, these, uh, all these data and I can make it into networks and I can make PDF prints of these networks. I will show you some to give some uh, examples. Uh, so for example, I can show how these networks look like and taking into account, are you seeing my screen now? Yes. So here you can see the entire network uh, in black. So now I have not made any attributes visible. But here you can already see with whom Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi was all in touch, who were the main scholars uh, in that time, who were the most connected scholars. 
So for example, uh, all literature until now would say that Mahmoud ibn Hamza al-Husseini was the most important scholar uh, in Damascus in the time of Qasimi. And I think I've already shown, I mean, it's not finished at all yet, but I've already shown, I think that Salim al-Attar and Bakri al-Attar, for example, were much more influential in the sense of scholar-student relationships. Uh, Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi, I think he's so big in this network because, I mean, obviously I've been looking at him more closely, so I have also more biographical data on him. But for example, I can also look at Madhab influence. So here, um, let me see, the blue ones are all uh, Shafi, the green ones are all Hanafi, the orange ones are all Hanbali, and there should be some Malikis visible as well. And of course, there is a rise of a la, la Madhabiya trend. So for example, Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi, you don't see him uh, identifying with one specific Madhab anymore. Uh, so I can try to trace that through these uh, visualizations. But also travels, for example. So uh, here I have made orange everyone who has traveled to Cairo, for example. So I can really see who was somehow under the intellectual influence of Cairo. A lot of people from Damascus in that time went to Cairo to study at Azhar. Um, uh, let me see, I have more examples, the Hejaz. So I can really see who all went to Hejaz yes. and who studied with, and what is important for this, for example, I also have one with India. Really no one was traveling to India, for example. So you can really see that intellectually, India was a different world uh, from Damascus in that time. Uh, but also Istanbul, you can see that the major figures in that time didn't really travel to Istanbul. So it was mostly the minor figures, let me see, who traveled to Istanbul. So in that way, I tried to reconstruct the intellectual influence in that time and also the political uh, entanglements involved with this. So here you can see Istanbul, all the black yeah. ones are Istanbul. So this is uh, yeah. how I try to use digital humanities now. That's great um, and really informative. And uh, there, there are already some questions in the chat and I will give them to you when we have the Q&A. Yeah. So there will be some more discussion on this. But first, uh, now I would really like, love to give Walid the chance to, to respond to yeah. this maybe in like 10 minutes or so. Um, yes. So Walid, go ahead. So hello, C can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Good. So first of all, thank you, Johanna and Majid, for organizing this. This is unbelievably wonderful, uh, like to, to gather us in this time. Uh, so uh, this is absolutely wonderful. So thank you. Uh, Peter, um, you have no idea how excited I am about your work. And it's a real honor and pleasure to be um, in dialogue with you. So first of all, what I want to emphasize is the significance of your work. Like in a sense, we really, we really desperately need these like detailed monographic, uh, in-depth look at, at these uh, tafasir and their authors. Now, uh, in, in, a, in a fascinating way, you're at a moment in history when you can do all of that, like not only study the tafsir, but also the network, the letters, the responses, and like it's such a rich uh, tapestry you're, you're, you're creating that is unbelievable. It's gonna change how we, in a sense, study modern tafsir. So I really love what you're doing, especially okay, like- Stop now, please. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm especially impressed that you're like uh, going through his letters because that's really, the letters are fundamental to in, in unearthing what we're doing. So I have a, like a, a few remarks really to emphasize and like uh, hopefully help you in a, in a sense with what you're doing. The first one is that I think, as you rightly point out, this is a critical moment in Islamic scholarship um, where, in a sense, we're at the beginning of print and the scholars who are uh, like uh, uh, coming under the print culture are still have full access to manuscripts. Because I really think you, you have to see three phases in Islamic scholarship in the 19th and 20th century. You have the pre-print culture where everybody still has um, if their scholars have access to manuscripts and they're uh, like uh, constrained by that, uh, uh, by that moment. Then you have the in-between, and this is Qasimi is an in-between. He has full access to manuscripts. He can, do, he can know that, like he can know around it, but he's yes. still now using uh, print culture. And then by the way, the third moment is when with what the, uh, 
our colleague uh, Ahmed uh, Shamsi has done is basically when you have this centralization of manuscripts mm. and then it becomes harder and harder to access it because it's nationalized and there's a bureaucracy that allows access or non-access. Yes. So then, now we really have this moment of full access is through print material. Yeah. And you find an impoverishment that would only be resolved till much later on. Yeah. So uh, Qasimi is in this in between, and that's what yeah. makes his works absolutely riveting to us, right? Uh, and you could see that by his sources, the way he uses his sources. Yes. Now, I read somewhere in the secondary literature that in his uh, tafsir, he cites a list, he has a list of his sources. Now I have the, um, the, the, like, you know, the Beirut edition, which I think yeah. is a, a bad edition. So I don't have access. So that actually would be a fascinating thing to, if we, uh, yeah. if we have the list of his sources. So yeah. that's a question that I'd like to, uh, to ask you. Yeah, actually. Yes, Do you want ahead. me to answer now? Or, yes, uh, yes, please. Yeah. 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 Actually, the, the Dar al-Hadith edition, it has a list of his sor sources in the back, uh, made by the editors. Uh, uh -huh. But I'm talking, but, I'm talking yeah. about him, Qasimi himself. Oh, yeah. Is it true that he has a list of his sources or that, that's a... That's, uh, uh, no, it's, it's not made by Qasimi himself. Okay, no. it's not uh, made. Okay, good. And, now, I think uh, that's also, why, why we really need the catalog of uh, the catalog of mm -hmm. his private library. It's really, uh, yeah, it's really pivotal that we somehow try to find that back. And, uh, okay. Yeah. Now, so then, uh, that's one thing. So, which edition should would you advise us to use? The first, like the, or which edition do you like? Do you? Uh, I personally still prefer the Muhammad Fuad Abdul Baqi uh, edition. Okay, so the first edition. Uh, yeah, I still prefer that one, but I think uh, the other editions are important for other matters to also yes. understand his reception. So yeah. for example, this Dar al-Hadith edition, uh, what I find really fascinating about it is that uh, uh, it, is really, it is really a project of what we, uh, in the terminology of Henri Logier, would call the purist Salafis. And you also see that they mention why they, uh, why they chose this work to edit and uh, republish is because uh, they wanted to have a tafsir available that has the correct understanding of the asma wa sifat. So uh, the reason that he does not do, uh, or the, the fact that he does not do ta'wil uh, on the names and attributes of God, that's what really uh, champions this tafsir for the purest Salafi movement, so to speak. And that's very interesting. And I think in Syria, there's also a Dar al-Fikr uh, edition. I haven't mm -hmm. come to study that enough because it was lost. I mean, I bought it in Egypt and then it was lost in the mill. So I only have the first, uh, <laughs> the first volume that I was smart enough to take in my, uh, <laughs> in my hand baggage. Uh, but I, I can imagine that they have a very different reason why they wanted to republish this. Because I noticed in other works of Qasimi, uh, in Damascus, for, for example, Zuhair uh, Shawish, one of the friends of Nasr al-Din al-Albani, he published a lot of the works from Al-Qasimi, for example, uh, but also Dar al-Fikr, uh, under the guidance of Nizar Abava. And when you look at their motivations for printing Qasimi uh, in this time, I mean, for Nizar, uh, Nizar al-Abava, he really was one of uh, the Munawirin, like he was one of the enlightened scholars. and. For Zuhair al-Shawish, yeah, he was la uh, madhabiya and he was uh, correct in his aqidah. And that's mm -hmm. why he cared so much about uh, Qasimi. So these later editions are still very important to study the reception of Qasimi in very different circles, um, which is very typical for these early Salafi figures, I would say. So I, I have, I have yeah. just two, well, two points. Well, more time because he's nearly out of time. <laughs> so. yes, just yeah. one point. Just one point to say is that like I really think that this uh, notion of is he original or not? I think he is yeah. original in, in yeah, some course, yeah. ways. So I think, r like radically so. Like yeah. the fact that he broke away from the Baidawi Madrasa Hashia yeah. paradigm yes. is is absolutely revolutionary at that yes. moment. In that sense, yeah. like, you know, it, it has to be um, it has to be taken into account. I'm yes. fine. Like I really think. As he is in between print and uh, manuscript, he's yeah. uh, Johanna Pink, or I think you um, um, mentioned that he's like, you know, a certain kind of Salafi that was still not Puritan. I think also you have to see in him that, um, like, 
he is in a sense part of a, a genre of tafsir to break away from the genre is not easy so like mm -hmm. in a, you can see that in the whole Salafi movement. They're trying to break away, but they're not aware how. Mm. And the, he's a good example. He wants to go to Ibn Taymiyyah, but he, you can't just leave like the tradition like in yeah. mass. So I think yes. that also is a moment that I like, I like about his work. He's also hermeneutically in between. And finally, I think I, I stuck to 10 minutes, right? <laughs> Good. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank I took you. some of your time, so. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. Is there anything more you wanted to say? I mean, you can. Who? Me? Yeah. Uh, oh, like, by the way, uh, like, to me, like, how, how brilliant he is, is that in his introduction, although he's, like, you know, clearly influenced by Thalab, uh, by Ibn Taymiyyah, he defends Thalabi. Mm. That defense yeah. is directed towards the undermining of Thalib by Ibn Taymiyyah. That's one. Yeah. He was, I think he was one of the first modern Quran commentators who have access to Biqai and he cites yeah. Biqai. So yeah, like, it, it so was actually easy. available in, uh, in, in Damascus, in the Ottoman library in Damascus, it was completely available. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and he mm. cites it and he has access. So like, in a sense, it, it's, it's fascinating how, in mm. a way, how, uh, like uh, his reach to the library to the Islamic yes. library is intense. Yeah, thank you. That's all. Yeah, that's all. Thank you so much, Walid. Getting Walid yeah. as his cousin is really great because he makes it feel so good. But and, in this case, this is more than deserved because you are really doing great, important work. So and I cannot stress much. enough. Actually, without Walid's work, uh, I couldn't have done what I'm doing now. I mean, it's uh, he really put me oh, on this. Uh, on this now track. you have to start. <laughs> now it's really true. I mean, I, I think Walid was really the one who first started writing about this uh, change in paradigms. And that's what really made me decide I have to look what exactly happened. So yeah, yeah. it was really influential to me as well. Yeah. So Walid, yeah. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, next thank week, you. Um, we are looking forward to uh, Majid talking with Peter Riddell um, from Melbourne and uh, Nico Captain will be his discussion. So um, this is going to be about the tafsir and Quran uh, manuscript and print maybe tradition in Southeast Asia, which is really going to be a fascinating talk as well. And I hope I'm going to see many of you there. So have a good day, evening, night, whatever time it is where you are. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you again. Bye. And thanks again, Peter and Walid yeah. and Majid.